Good morning and welcome back humans of 45A. Today I'm going to read to you chapter 5 of our book Rules. Yesterday I read to you chapter 4 and demonstrated how to complete the first literature circle job discussion leader. Today as I'm reading through please pause the audio and write down any open-ended questions that pop up to you as I'm reading. When you do this, please open up the literature circle slide and add in your questions. Remember, you need to come up with four open-ended questions about the chapter I am going to read to you. Here we go. Chapter five. If you don't have the words you need, borrow someone else's. At home, I line Jason's blank cards on my desk, ready to draw. But choosing words is harder than I thought. Seven white squares full of possibility. I look around my bedroom for ideas, from the checkered rug on my floor to the calendar of Georgia or Keith's flower paintings that Dad had bought me at an art museum he took me to last summer. That's my dream, to be an artist and have people gasp when they see my paintings, like I do on the first day of each new month. I have a tiny clothespin at the bottom of the calendar pages so I don't cheat and peek ahead. I want each month's flower to be a surprise. On my door is a long mirror surrounded with colored sticky note reminders. My library books are due. Bring fine money. August 8th is Melissa's birthday. Remember, it takes seven to nine business days for mail to get to California. Plan ahead. And even a few reminders left over from school. Fine lunch card. Project due Tuesday. I kept those up because it's nice to see them and know they don't matter anymore. On my desk is a little bamboo plant in the blue swirly dish Melissa gave me for my last birthday. And my computer with the longest, hardest to spell password I could think of. Anthropological. That so David won't figure it out. Across one bookshelf is a row of art supplies and cans, pencils, markers, and paintbrushes. On the next shelf are paint bottles and stacks of paper. Everything from thick watercolor paper to flimsy sheets of jewel colored tissue paper and lots of things I've collected. Shells, rocks, a tiny glass elephant, a blackened old skeleton key that my grandmother found in a chest, but which unlocks nothing. I kept it because I like how it feels in my hand, the heart shape of the top and the jagged teeth at the bottom, and because, one of David's rules, not everything worth keeping has to be useful. Between my desk and my bed is a long window with purple curtains that let daylight through, even when the curtains are closed. And on the window seal is a row of tiny colored bottles I bought one day at Elliot's Antiques. Suddenly purple, green, and gold. On the other side of my desk hangs my bulletin board, covered with drawings and little paintings. A pencil gray castle I started but never finished. A monkey painted on an emerald tissue paper rainforest. A colored pencil cartoon from three years ago of my guinea pigs dancing. I still like it, even if it's old and I can do better now. Well, there's something. I pick up my pencil and write on the first cards. Drawing. Guinea pig. Under my window, nutmeg and cinnamon purr happily, shuffling through the shavings in their cage. Nutmeg lifts her head and I look away quick. Anytime they catch me watching them, my guinea pigs think I should feed them. Picking up the next card, I decide I shouldn't do just me words. That day with the guitar, Jason should have used something fiery to say something juicier than sad or mad. A string of words popped to mind, but I don't want to get in trouble with his mom. So I choose gross, awesome, stinks a big one. I'm not going to show those to mom, especially the last one. I don't remember seeing explanation points on any of Jason's other cards, but awesome with a period doesn't seem right. And if gross has one explanation point, stinks a big one needs at least three. My pen hovers over the sixth card. I could do another favorite, raspberry sherbet or ice skating or goldfish. I look past my messy closet. Here's another rule. Open closet doors carefully. Sometimes things fall out. To the CDs, cassettes and books lining the shelves near my bed. But Jason already has book and music and who knows if he even likes raspberry sherbet. I could pick words about the clinic, hallway, or bookshelf, or magazine. Or I could do funny words like hotty toddy, or angry ones like oh yeah, 
or hurt words like, I don't mean to. There's a gazillion words and phrases I could choose, and none of them see worth one of my two last cards. So I push the blank cards aside and draw pictures for the others. Drawing a guinea pig is easy. I sketch an oval, fat and compact. Add brown eyes, tiny rounded ears tucked under feet, and a mess of every which way hair. A furry baked potato. Other words are harder. What does awesome look like? Smiley face? A surprise? A double hot fudge sundae? My door creaks open a couple inches. A brown eye peeks through the crack. David never remembers to knock. It irritates me so much I tape this rule above my doorknob. This is Catherine's rule. David must knock before he enters her room. No toys in the fish tank, he says. I pull forward one of the two blank cards and write in big, bold letters an unbendable, sharp-cornered David rule. word. Rule. By the time I get to the living room, David's already crouched in front of the fish tank, his smiling face reflected in glass. Out the window behind the aquarium, I see Mum in the yard talking to the mailman. And in the fish tank, one of my old Barbie dolls sits on the gravel, her arm raised in a friendly wave as though she spotted Ken across the living room and is inviting him to join her. The goldfish nibble at the Barbie doll. The goldfish are used to David dropping strange beans into their tank. They always swim over to check out the newest arrival and try to eat it. When that doesn't work, they accept it, along with their usual plastic plants and little castle. Remember the rule. I flip open the top of the aquarium. aquarium. No toys in the fish tank. David nods, but I'm not fooled. He may not buy into the fish tank rule, but he's got this one down pat. If you want someone to leave you alone, agree with her. You can only put things in here that belong, I explain, like stuff you buy at the pet store. That's all that goes into the fish tank. David leans in for a closer view as I pull Barbie up through the water. Will Power is trying hard not to do something that you really want to do, said Frog. He glances to me, hopeful. Mom says David will never learn to talk right if we keep letting him borrow words. But his face is so full of pleas, I say. You mean like trying not to eat all of those cookies, said Toad? Water from Barbie's hair trickles down my arm as I hold her over the fish tank, waiting for the dripping to stop. Through the window, I notice Mum's gone, and the girl next door is in her yard with Ryan. He points at my house, and the girl spins around. She waves. I drop Barbie to wave back. No toys in the fish tank, David cries. It's wet. It's okay, I say out of the corner of my smile. It was an accident. I'll get her back out. Ryan keeps talking, his hands moving like he's explaining something. I hope he isn't saying things about me, especially not how I yelled at him when he called David a retard on the bus. But her wave doesn't seem like a making fun wave. It seemed more of a hi. What? Glancing to David, I see his pants waded at his feet. I jump in front of the window to pull the curtains closed. David, go find mom now. I have a pants rule too. Pantless brothers are not my problem.